Chapter One of Travel Stories Retold from St. Nicholas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Travel Stories from St. Nicholas by Various. Chapter One The Grand Canyon of Arizona by William Haskell Simpson many of those who seek and love earth's greatest scenery have declared that they found it at the grand canyon of arizona travelers flock to it from the ends of the earth though the majority of the visitors numbering every year about a hundred thousand are americans the grand canyon of the colorado river in northern arizona is indeed a world wonder and there is no other chasm in the world worthy to be compared with it it is more than two hundred miles long including marble canyon is from ten to thirteen miles wide in the granite gorge section and is more than a mile deep it was created ages and ages ago by the erosive action of water wind and frost and it is still being deepened and widened imperceptibly year by year the colorado river which drains a region of three hundred thousand square miles and is two thousand miles long from the rise of its principal source is formed in southern utah by the junction of the grand and the green rivers and flowing through utah and arizona to tidewater at the gulf of california it dashes in headlong torrent through this titanic gorge this dream of color tinted like a rainbow or a sunset the canyon is reached by a railroad running to the rim and may be visited any day in the year it is unlike most other scenery because when standing on its rim you look down instead of up imagine a gigantic trough filled with bare mountains on each side and sloping to a narrow channel which in turn is carved deeply and steeply out of solid granite you come upon it unawares from the level timbered plateau country the experience is an absolutely unique one only when you go down one of the trails to the bottom and look up is the view more nearly like other grand mountain vistas the first glimpse always is from the upper edge and having no previous standard of measurement you find it difficult to adjust yourself to this strange condition the distant rim swims in a bluish haze the nearer red rocks forming the inner canyon buttes crowned with massive tablelands that look like temples minarets and battlements reflect the sunlight in myriad hues it seems a vast illusion rather than reality no wonder that the first look often awes the spectator into silence and tears but before you have been here long you will wish to know how it all happened you will ask how the canyon was made that question was asked by a little girl of captain john hance one of the pioneer guides hance contests with a few other early comers the distinction of being the biggest romancer in arizona he told her that he dug it all himself why captain hance she said in astonishment what did you do with all the dirt he quickly replied i built the san francisco peaks off there with it just between ourselves no one absolutely can tell just how the miracle occurred for no human being was there at the time but the geologist has put together bit by bit thousands of facts dug from the rocks which here lie exposed like a mammoth layer cake and his explanation is so convincing that it must stand as at least the probable truth here may be seen rocks of the four geological periods which are among the very oldest of our earth the rocks of later periods were here once too making a layer more than two miles high resting on what is today the top but in some remote age they were shaved off by some great natural force perhaps a glacier the eating away of the rocks which form the canyon itself is modern scientists say it was done as it were last monday or tuesday for it was when the top two-thirds had been shaved off as we have said that the colorado river began to cut the grand canyon through the rocks that formed the lower third while the cracking of the crust caused by internal fires may have helped the process of canyon making the result of erosion is seen everywhere 
every passing shower every desert wind every snowfall changes the contour of the region imperceptibly but surely the canyon is nature's open book in which we may read how the earth was built with the coming of the railroad when this century was yet a baby tourists began to flock in hotels were built highways constructed trails bettered and other improvements made today the traveler finds here every comfort although first glimpsed by white men in 1540 when the spanish conquistadors appeared one expedition journeying from the hopi pueblos in tuiseon across the painted desert the big canyon remained unvisited except for indians and trappers until 1858 when lieutenant ives of the army engineer corps made a brief exploration of the lower reaches of the colorado coming out at cataract creek it was not thoroughly explored until the year 1869 when major john w powell made his memorable voyage from the entrance to the mouth of the great gorge passing down the green and colorado rivers though he lost two boats and four men he pushed on to the end it is fitting that the united states government has erected to his memory a massive monument of native rock with bronze tablets on one of the points near el tovar hotel powell's outfit consisted of nine men and four rowboats the distance traveled exceeded one thousand miles from what is now green river utah through the series of canyons to the mouth of the rio virgin in the spring of 1871, he again started with three boats and descended the river to the crossing of the Fathers. The following summer, Lee's Ferry was his point of departure, and he went as far as the mouth of Kanab Wash. Beginning with the Russell and Monnet party in 1907, several others have essayed to duplicate Powell's achievement, and successfully too, though without adding to our scientific knowledge of the canyon. The trips are exceedingly dangerous, for the rapids conceal rocks that would wreck any boat, and the currents are treacherous. It is safer by far to sit at home and read Powell's story. The average traveler spends too short a time at the canyon. He arrives in the morning and leaves in the evening. Those wise ones, who go about things in more leisurely fashion, stay from three days to a week. There are certain things that everybody does. Simply by looking through the big telescope at the lookout, an intimate view may be had of the far-off north rim and of the river gorge five miles below in an airline. It is easier than actually going to these places, though both are accessible. The north rim, or Kebab Plateau, is about a quarter of a mile higher than the south rim, where you are standing, and is thickly forested with giant pines. Clear streams are found here, and wild game in abundance. Mountain lions hide in the rocks, and bobcats haunt the trees. It is the home of the bear, too. You may see two sassy young sample specimens outside the house where the Indians stay, opposite El Tovar Hotel. The way across the canyon to the north side is not an easy one, as the Colorado must be crossed in a steel cage suspended from a cable which stretches dizzily from bank to bank. Then follows the stiff climb up Bright Angel Creek along a trail seldom used. The Hopi House, where the Indians give their dances every evening for free entertainment of guests, is another attraction. It is occupied by representatives of the Snake Dance Hopis, whose home is many miles northeast across the Painted Desert. You won't see the Snake Dance, of course, but you will witness ceremonies just as interesting, participated in by men, women, and children of the Hopi and Navajo tribes. The little tots especially are very cute. They execute difficult steps in perfect time and with the utmost solemnity, while the drummer beats the tom-tom and the singer chants his weird songs. Here you may see Navajo silversmiths at work, fashioning curious ornaments from Mexican coins and turquoise, also deft weavers of blankets and baskets. The Havasupai Reservation in Cataract Canyon is about 60 miles away, and Indians from that hidden place of the Blue Waterfalls are frequent visitors around the railway station. 
all of these indians understand the language of uncle sam many of them are carlisle or riverside graduates and one young hopi is writing a history of his tribe in university english have you ever ridden a mule if not you will learn how at the canyon for only on muleback can travelers easily make the trip down and up the trail walking is all right going down but the climb coming back will tire out the strongest hiker hence the mule or burrow long as to ears long as to memory and sad as to his songs of the visitors fat and lean tall and short old and young to each is assigned a mule of the right size and disposition together with a khaki riding suit which fits more or less all surmounted by hats that are useful rather than ornamental it is a motley crowd that starts off in the morning in charge of careful guides from the roof of the world a motley crowd but gay and suspiciously cheerful it is likewise a motley crowd that slowly climbs up out of the earth toward evening but subdued and inclined still to cling to the patient mule what did you see asked curious friends quite likely they saw more mule than canyon being concerned with the immediate views along the trail rather than the thrilling vistas unfolding at each turn nine out of ten of them could tell you their mule's name yet would hesitate to say much about zoroaster or angel's gate they could identify the steep descent of the devil's corkscrew for they were a part of it the mystery of the deep gulf stretching overhead and all around probably did not reach them that is the penalty one pays for being too much occupied with things close at hand yet only by crawling down into the awful depths can the canyon be fully comprehended afterward from the upper rim all trail parties take lunch on the river's bank the colorado is about two hundred feet wide here and lashed into foam by the rapids its roar is like that of a thousand express trains the place seems uncanny at night under the stars you appear to be in another world no water is to be found on the south rim for one hundred miles east and west of el tovar except what falls in the passing summer showers and that is quickly soaked up by the dry soil all the water used for the small army of horses and mules maintained by the transportation department likewise for the big hotel and annex and other facilities is hauled by rail and tank cars from a point one hundred and twenty five miles distant the vast volume of water in the colorado river only seven miles away is not available no way has yet been found to pump economically the precious fluid from a river that today is thirty feet deep and tomorrow is seventy feet deep flowing below you at the depth of over a mile another curious fact is this the drainage on the south side is away from the canyon not into it the ground at the edge of the abyss is higher than it is a few miles back during the winter of nineteen seventeen there was an unusual fall of snow which covered the sides and bottom of the canyon down to the river nothing like it had been seen for a quarter of a century generally what little snow falls is confined to the rim and the upper slopes at times the immense gulf was completely filled with clouds and then the canyon looked like an inland lake as a rule this part of arizona is a land of sunshine the high altitude means cool summers the southerly latitude means pleasant winters naturally a place like the grand canyon has attracted many great artists and other distinguished visitors moving picture companies have staged thrilling photo plays in these picturesque surroundings photographers by the score have trained their finest batteries of lenses on rim trail and river some of them getting remarkable results in natural colors unmoved by this galaxy of talent however the grand canyon refuses wholly to give up its secrets always there will be something new for the seeker and interpreter of tomorrow the grand canyon is a forest reserve and a national monument a bill has been introduced in congress to make it a national park meanwhile the united states forest service and the railway company are doing all they can to increase the facilities for visitors a forest ranger is located nearby 
his force looks out for fires and polices the tusayan forest district covering such a large area with only a few men a system has been worked out for locating fires quickly fifteen minutes saved often means victory snatched from defeat water is not available for this is a waterless region except during the short rainy season so recourse must be had to other devices such as backfiring and smothering with dirt official government names for prominent objects in the region have been substituted for most of the old-time local names for example your attention is invited to yavapai point so called after a tribe of indians instead of o'neill's point these american indian words are musical and belong to the country and the names of spanish explorers and aztec rulers also seem suited to the place thus the great canyon has been saved the fate of bearing the hackneyed or prosaic names that have been given to many places of wonderful natural beauty throughout our country think of a lover's leap down an abyss of several thousand feet that atrocity happily has been spared us in this favored region this great furrow on the brow of arizona never can be made common by the hand of man it is too big for ordinary desecration always it will be the ideal place of silence let us continue to hope that the incline railway will not be established here suitable though it may be elsewhere nor the merry-go-round the useful automobile is barred on the highway along the edge of the chasm though it is permitted in other sections it has been my good fortune to meet at the canyon many noted artists writers lecturers movie celebrities singers and preachers the impression made upon each one of them by this titanic chasm is almost always the same at first outward indifference on guard not to be overwhelmed for they have seen much the wide world over then a restrained enthusiasm but with emotions well in check after longer acquaintance more enthusiasm and less restraint at the end full surrender to the magic spell end of chapter one chapter two of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two in rainbow land by amy sutherland until only a few years ago the greatest wonder of the world lay hidden away in one of the most savage parts of africa the natives of that region terrified by its mysterious columns of vapor and its subterranean thunder did not venture within many miles of it the white man who had looked upon it could be counted on the fingers of one hand and yet more than fifty years have passed since the explorer livingston journeying eastward along the zambesi first beheld that rainbow mist rise above the forest of its cause he could learn nothing from the savages and so except for his own conjectures he came quite unprepared upon his splendid discovery he approached it by the river which above the falls is a mile wide and below them runs for fifty miles at the bottom of a gorge between four and five hundred feet deep whose twin walls of black precipitous rock show for all that distance scarcely a ledge or slope where the smallest plant may cling so after a peep downward at the falls from the island on their brink which now bears his name he left his new-found marvel less than half seen and departed whence he came and the loneliness of those vast solitudes brooded once more over forest and river to be broken only at rare intervals by some wandering hunter or perhaps by a party of men adventuring through endless toil and danger to behold a wonder whose fame even then spread as far as that tiny portion of south africa where white men dwelt and civilization held sway so things remained until the day of cecil rhodes under whose auspices went forth the foretrackers or pioneers to colonize the vast land now called rhodesia in the heart of which the victoria falls lie 
many of these fortrekkers and their wives and children died at the hands of the savage amadabeli tribe of natives but the survivors in the end were victorious and the country became their own cecil rhodes died and was laid in his lonely grave among the matapo hills on a rocky summit which looks far out over the land he loved but his wishes were remembered the greatest and the least of them and still year by year the central african railway grows every year a little northward through the forests and now it has reached the zambezi and over that hitherto unconquerable gorge has been thrown one of the most wonderful railway bridges ever built and close by has sprung up a great hotel so that the victoria falls and their surroundings are attainable at last by all the world for many days the approaching traveller has been flying through a mighty tropical forest in which a path has been cut for the railway line but which is otherwise so undisturbed so vast and silent and lonely that it is hard to believe white men can ever make a home in it here the lion prowls at his own sweet will and legions of antelopes great and small graze on the sweet belt and here elephants wander in troops of fifty or more and in the swamps the hippopotamus ploughs his way through the papyrus reed and the ten-foot rhodesian grass the little iron shanties of the railway men are the only signs of civilized life the natives of the country are few and far between their kraals with the conical huts peculiar to this race of africans look down from the rare slight eminences there is no change in the scenery little to give warning of the wonder that one approaches only above the noise of the train a far-off murmur of sound grows upon the ear and a little while later floating upward from out of the forest there comes in sight a long line of snowy vapour which as the low sun touches it glows with soft many-coloured lights this mist cloud is caused by the sudden narrowing of the great zambezi river in the chasm not two hundred yards wide which receives the falls at the end of their leap the cloud rises at times as much as five hundred feet into the air and there condenses into rain which falls in eternal showers glorious in this thirsty land and makes in the country close about the falls one perpetual spring this tract of land is known as the rain forest and in its tropical magnificence its soft and delicate beauty can surely be surpassed by nothing on earth all about the path laboriously cut through its jungles rise the trunks of splendid trees which seem to tower into the very sky their stems and the earth about them are hidden in masses of giant ferns whose long sprays sway and quiver continually under the weight of the falling drops strange plants of many kinds grow here orchids droop from the trees and palms raise their graceful heads from out the tangle through it all drift the rainbow vapours and from between the trees the sun strikes in long slanting rays and lights up the wet vegetation the rising mist the falling raindrops with an effect so tenderly and unutterably lovely that it often brings tears to the eyes in places the forest is more open and here the giant rhodesian grass grows twelve feet high its flower heads heavy with wet and palms free from the jungle and able to grow as they will rise thirty feet into the air their every fringed leaf hung with gems at any time a few steps will take the traveller from out this forest of rainbows to where he may stand on the very verge of the terrific chasm here he is directly opposite the falls which come rushing over the further tip in a mass of foam as white as snow to fall with a roar more than four hundred feet into the dreadful abyss by leaning over it is possible at times to see the river at the bottom a boiling turbulent torrent racing furiously to the right along its rock-bound bed but more often all is hidden in the mist which is hurled upward so densely that in places the chasm seems choked with it and it rushes past the observer with an audible sound and a suggestion of irresistible force 
awe-inspiring to a degree opposite the main falls a spot known to the natives as shongle the cauldron it is so heavy as to blot out sky forests and even the falls themselves and we are in a strange twilight half smothered in vapors and wholly deafened with the thunderous roar of the falls so close at hand everywhere are double rainbows of surpassing brightness sometimes arches sometimes complete glowing circles they are so close one may watch their melting colors as in a soap bubble and they move and change continually with the sun or the movements of the spectator they gleam softly in the cloud brilliantly against the stern black cliffs and tiny rainbows by hundreds dance in the falling sheets of water and among the palms and ferns of the forest a strange circumstance cannot fail to strike the observer and awe him as perhaps nothing else could with a sense of the vast depth of the fissure into which he fearfully gazes the spray and rain bring into being hundreds of streams which flash over the edge of the cliff opposite the falls in an eternal effort to rejoin their parent river but they never reach the bottom long before they are halfway down they vanish dissipated once more into spray and borne upward in the form of lighted mist of the radiant beauty of the whole scene one writer a traveller of renown says i believe that on that day i was gazing at the most perfectly beautiful spectacle of all this beautiful world as the sun's rays fell on that kaleidoscopic ever-moving changing scene made up of rock water mist and shivering foliage the colouring of it all was gorgeous yet of sweetly tender tints under that luminous pearly atmosphere formed by the spray mist below where one caught glimpses of the rushing water it was turned brown and golden blue and rich dark green the cliff sparkling with dripping water was of shining black and glowing bronze the foliage of the rainforest was of the green of an eternal spring and a myriad jewels of twinkling light were made by the water drops on the trembling leaves a glorious rainbow spanned the chasm and other rainbows flitted in the haze as for the tender pale beauty of the cataract and of the luminous pearly mist no words could convey it to the imagination another writer says the beauty of the pearl-tinted atmosphere and the glory of the dazzling rainbows are the first and the last impressions that the victoria falls give to the mind the eastern extremity of the cliff opposite the falls is known as danger point and here the chasm turns abruptly at right angles and becomes the famous gorge which for fifty miles zigzags across country with the zambezi like a silver cord at the bottom of it just at the turning point a mass of rocks has fallen from the cliff and lies below in the river a mass which it is interesting to note livingston described as just ready to fall and which in his drawing of the scene is represented as almost parted from the rest along the gorge a strong cold wind blows always and bears the mist as far as the railway bridge and the exquisite palm groves near it above the falls the scene is scarcely less fair here lies the broad zambezi placid and calm under its sunny skies with its fifty islands palm crowned wonderful kept ever green and spring-like by the soft spray showers on the banks grows the burly baobab whose trunk is as large as a house lovely forest fringes either shore and gay plumaged birds flit among the flowering trees and feast on the plentiful wild fruits from here the mists of victoria take the form of five towering pillars bending with the wind white below but dark farther up where they condense into rain livingston says of the river at this point no one can imagine the beauty of the view from anything witnessed elsewhere it had never been seen before by european eyes but scenes so lovely must have been gazed upon by angels in their flight the monstrous footprints of the hippopotami are thick along the banks and crocodiles lie sunning themselves in the open spaces 
tiny gray monkeys with wise black faces swing from the miles of creeper which festoon the trees green parrots shriek and strange great reptiles crash a path through the tangle the savage natives punt or paddle their dugouts on the placid bosom of the river so recent is the white man's advent that the whole is scarcely changed from the day when david livingston first looked upon it and realized with beating heart the wonder he had found End of chapter two chapter three of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three traveling in india by mabel alberta spicer here in the western world where everything is hustle and bustle where express trains automobiles telephones telegraphs pneumatic tubes and most recently aeroplanes save us hours of time it is difficult to realize that on the other side of the world things are moving along at the same slow pace at which they did centuries ago also here in america where everybody is saying i have no time i have no time i have no time it seems strange to think that there are countries where time has no value whatsoever where people believe they have to live thousands and thousands of lives before they reach their heaven and consequently have no regard for time imagine spending the whole night in the train to go one or two hundred miles imagine also everybody's surprise if some traveller should attempt to take with him into an american sleeping car a roll of bedding a box of ice sawdust and bottles of soda water a huge lunch basket spirit lamps umbrella cases hat boxes suitcases and bags without number a talkative parrot and a folding chair or two he would be thought quite mad of course and would not be allowed to enter the car yet this is how people travel in the trains of india sometimes to be sure the chairs and noisy parrot are left at home but quite as often golf sticks and a folding cot are substituted native travellers often carry their cooking utensils and stoves with them no one is in a hurry and the train often waits quite long enough at stations for them to install their stoves on the platform and cook a good dish of rice most trains have first second and third class carriages europeans and americans usually travel first class for the best in india is bad enough when compared with the luxuries of travel in western countries most of the carriages are about half as long as those in america and divided into two compartments without a corridor each having a lavatory at one end running along each side of the compartment just under the windows is a long leather-covered bench which serves as a seat during the day and a berth at night it is equally uncomfortable in both capacities above this folded up against the side of the car is a leather-covered shelf that lets down to form the upper berth my first experience in indian trains was at night my turbaned servant arranged my bedding on a bench in a compartment reserved for ladies switched on an electric fan salaamed and went off to find his place in a servant's compartment adjoining most trains have special compartments for servants it is impossible to travel comfortably in india without native servants while i was in the dressing-room preparing for the night i heard a noise outside and looking out saw an old man with a lantern down on his knees looking under the berths he said that he was looking for me that he was afraid i had missed the train finally after a great ringing of bells tooting of whistles waving of lanterns and a chattering of natives we pulled out into the darkness and heat the electric fan burred mosquitoes hummed and bit the train rocked wildly from side to side i was just dozing off when lights were flashed in my eyes more bells whistles and chattering natives the door burst open and an englishman ordered his man to put his luggage in the compartment i called out that it was reserved for ladies and he disappeared with a sorry out into the darkness again only to be aroused at the next station by the guard who shouted tickets please the night was one prolonged nightmare of heat noise jolting and mosquitoes 
by five i was beginning to sleep when i was startled by a cry of chota hazri i sat up in alarm wondering what those dreadful sounding words could mean when the shutters by my head were suddenly lowered and a tray of toast and tea thrust in at me i accepted it and gave up all idea of sleep the dreadful sounding words i found meant little breakfast sometimes we had our meals from a tiffin basket which we carried with us sometimes from a restaurant car or again at the station cafe while the train waited and sometimes when all of these failed us not at all during the winter travelling was more comfortable it was so cold that we needed heavy rugs over us some of the express trains go from twenty to thirty miles an hour each time that the train stops there is great confusion the natives arrive at the station hours ahead of time here they squat patiently until the train arrives when they quite lose their heads in an attempt to find places in the crowded carriages they run excitedly up and down the platform clinging to one another clutching at their clumsy luggage and screaming at their servants and the trainmen equally agitated groups pour out of the cars and scurry off to find bullock carts or ecas to drive them to the town which is usually some distance from the station boys and women with sweets fruit drinking water toys cheap jewelry and various articles of native production cry their wares at the car windows others sell newspapers which are apt to be weeks old if the purchaser does not insist upon seeing the date the platform presents a riot of strange costumes bright colors quick-moving figures with jingling bangles and ankles unholy odors and clamorous sounds at the stations we were met in different parts of india by the greatest imaginable variety of conveyances carriages with footmen and drivers in state livery sent by the native princes hotel and public carriages after models never dreamed of in america bullock carts elephants camels rickshaws and in calcutta and bombay taxi automobiles when your driver starts off down the street at a reckless gait clanging a bell in the floor of the carriage with his foot and a boy on a step at the back calls out tobe as you bowl along you wonder if you have not taken by mistake a police wagon or an ambulance but it is all right you hear the same shouting and clanging of bells from all the other carriages along the route this noise is necessary to make the idlers who stroll along the streets hand in hand get out of the way of the carriages there are so many horses in india that one wonders why any one should ever walk and in fact very few do they are of all grades differing as much as does the shabbiest beggar from the most gorgeous rajah the conveyances to which they are harnessed range from the rickety public ekas to the royal gold and silver coaches used on state occasions one sees these wretched-looking public carriages that can be hired for a few cents filled with lazy natives and pulled along by a poor little pony that looks as if it were half starved contrasting with these poor overworked creatures are the thoroughbreds which literally die in the stables of the princes for lack of exercise when we were visiting in the native states the chiefs sometimes offered us saddle horses the first time i rode one of these i started off gaily nothing fearing from a gentle canter my mount suddenly broke into a dead run supposing that horses in all countries understood the same language i said woe first mildly persuasively then loudly imploringly but without the slightest effect on he sped faster and faster until he overtook another horse apparently a friend of his for he slowed down to a walk beside it i learned afterward that a sound similar to that used in america to make a horse go is used in india to make him stop so the poor deer did not understand in the least my frantic cries of woe the only other swift-moving animal that it was my misfortune to encounter in india was a camel this was in the north in the desert of rajputana there we were going to visit some tombs about five miles from the city 
the others went in carriages but i preferred to try the fleet-footed camel the creature knelt docilely enough to let me climb into the saddle back of the driver then he unfolded his many jointed legs in rows throwing me forward and backward in a most uncomfortable manner he walked haughtily about the grounds of the guest house a few minutes turning up his nose at everybody then suddenly let his hind legs collapse almost throwing me off the driver succeeded in making him understand that there was no use making a fuss that he would have to take us off across the desert he started at a gait so rough that i know of nothing with which to compare it at first i tried to hold to the saddle but it was too slippery so there was nothing to do but to throw my arms about the driver and hang on to him with all my might i returned in a carriage at mysore and several other places we saw camel carriages they make a queer sight these ungainly loose-jointed animals shambling along in the harness at bikanir we watched the camel corps drill the natives in this part of india are very finely built men and they look most imposing in their gaily coloured uniforms and turbans as they sit erect on the arrogant camels who snub even their masters there are so many slow lazy ways of travelling in india that it is difficult to say which is the slowest perhaps the bullocks when they walk are the slowest of all they do however sometimes trot and that at a rather brisk pace they are beautiful animals and very different from those in america their skin is wonderfully soft and silky between their shoulders is a large grisly hump from their chin down between their forelegs hangs a loose flabby fold of skin of these the most beautiful are the huge white bulls sacred to the hindu god shiva these lead a life of leisure and luxury they roam about the streets unmolested eating from the fruit and vegetable stalls at will some are housed in the temples of the god those who are not so lucky as to be held sacred have a rather hard time of it they do most of the heavy hauling and often suffer very cruel treatment from their drivers in fact no other animal is so much the victim of the cruelty and ignorance of the natives as these poor bullocks we drove in all sorts of curious-looking conveyances behind these somewhat refractory creatures once we drove out into a desolate region to visit some deserted temples seated on the floor of a bullock cart with an arched cover of plaited bamboo over us the men along the road walked faster than our bullocks which went so slowly that had it not been for the jolting of the cart we should scarcely have known that we were moving in the southernmost part of the peninsula along the malabar coast where there are no trains we travelled in cabin boats rowed by natives it took them all night to row from quillen to tavendrum about fifty miles along the backwater they sang from the moment they began to row timing the strokes of the oar to the rhythm of their song in the morning they appeared as smiling and fresh as they had the evening before when we started in madras we rode in rickshaws like those of china and japan in many parts of india men take the place of animals both in carrying people and in transporting cargo several times we were carried up mountains in dollies by coolies these dollies consist of a seat swung between two poles by ropes they are carried by two or four men who trot off up the hill with the poles resting on their shoulders while the passenger dangles between them they used to come down the mountain so fast that we were quite terrified the seat would twist and sway hit against trees graze along the side of rocks while our porters would dance along talking and laughing without paying the slightest attention to us then there are various kinds of push carts used in different parts of the country of course the really indian way of travelling is on elephants very few however except princes and foreign travellers ever ride on these lordly animals in the zoos in calcutta and bombay there are elephants for the children to ride the riders climb steps to a platform the height of the elephant's back then jump into the howdah where they are tied fast to make sure of their not falling the old huthi as the elephant is called there sways off waving his trunk 
flopping his ears and blinking his eyes he makes a tour of the gardens then returns to the platform to get other children in jaipur kwalior and a number of other towns where there is a fort on a hill elephants can be hired for the ascension the huge creatures knelt down while we clambered into the howdah with the aid of ladders when they rose it seemed like an earthquake to us on their backs they climbed the hill so slowly that the others of the party who walked arrived ahead of us our houthi would smell about carefully with his trunk before taking each step then he would put a huge foot forward cautiously and throw his great weight upon it slowly as if afraid that the earth would give way under him it took him so long to accommodate his four feet to each step that i was thankful he had not as many as a centipede to appreciate an elephant in all his glory one should see him in the splendor of princely procession designs in bright colors are painted on his forehead and trunk trappings of silver ornament his tusks head and ankles a rich cloth of gold and silver embroidery hangs over his colossal sides and on his back is perched a rare howdah often of gold and silver with silk hangings aloft in the howdah rides the prince resplendent with gold silk and jewels in front on the elephant's neck sits the mahout urging him on with strange sounding grunts and prods from a short pointed spear the elephants are reserved for state occasions most of the princes now have automobiles which they look upon much as a child does its latest toy the mass of the people depend upon the bullocks and horses to cart them about there are now also in most parts of the empire telephones and telegraphs but they are such ancient systems and so unreliable that they are not to be compared with ours india is through and through a lazy country where nobody is in a hurry End of chapter three chapter four of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter four where the sunsets of all the yesterdays are found by olin d wheeler in montana idaho and northern wyoming lies the region where center the headwaters of the missouri yellowstone green and snake rivers the last named a branch of the columbia in the early years of the last century it was virtually the center of all human activity in the rocky mountain region being a prolific but dangerous trapping ground for the fur trade of those days here the cloud-piercing peaks of the american rockies reach their greatest altitude and the scenery is of the wildest and most impressive character the grand teton thirteen thousand seven hundred and forty seven feet elevation overlooking the magnificent jackson lake basin has been climbed but twice by white men since the yellowstone park was established in eighteen seventy two the wonders of this region have been more or less familiar but prior to eighteen seventy they were believed to exist largely in the fertile imagination of the trapper the park region as we will call it lay between the old-time northern and southern routes of frontier day travel across the continent it is true there were indian trails leading across and through it but the indians superstitious by nature seem to have avoided the localities of the geysers and hot springs and their north and south bound trails lay to the east or west of these areas that now fascinate and interest us in 1807, along one of these outside trails, one that just skirted the eastern side of the geyser zone, which here lies along a well-defined north and south axis, came the first white man who visited the region. He saw the two beautiful lakes, Jackson and Yellowstone, the dazzling Grand Canyon and its two falls, probably some of the hot springs, and possibly some of the inferior geysers. His trail is shown, marked Coulter Route in 1807, on the map of the great explorers Lewis and Clark in 1814. But it was after their return to civilization that they learned of this hot springs brimstone locality. John Coulter was a prince of adventurers. His life as a border hero, explorer, and trapper rivals that of any character of fiction. 
his discovery of the yellowstone while on a mission to an indian tribe was purely accidental but it brought him lasting fame he himself probably never realized its importance two or three other old-time and adventurous mountaineers particularly james or jim bridger afterward visited this locality but people in general utterly refused seriously to consider let alone believe what these men told them regarding it bridger was a man of remarkable ability as a guide and mountaineer although unable to read or even to write his own name he was the discoverer of great salt lake and as a guide and natural born scout had no superior if indeed an equal among frontiersmen in this capacity he served numerous government and other expeditions and explored and traversed a large part of what was then the far west he could tell many a good story about his hairbreadth escapes and lived to a ripe old age to attempt a word picture of this region and its weird and unusual features is almost useless and yet every one who visits it endeavors to do so no words can be found adequately to describe the hot springs that are numbered by the thousands and the marvelous hues of their waters and their basins rimmed and ornamented by fluted and beaded parapets of incredible delicacy and beauty nor can the geysers leaping suddenly from their deep nether-world reservoirs be pictured by words in such a way as to convey to the mind a real image of their strange and fascinating reality the first printed description of one of them was by another trapper warren a ferris of the old american fur company he visited a geyser area in eighteen thirty four but his account of it was not published until july eighteen forty two numerous waterfalls are found here from cascades a few feet in height to cataracts having twice the leap of niagara lakes lie deeply embosomed among the high peaks or the heavy forests and one of them twenty miles in length and a mile and a half above the ocean is now being navigated think of it by motorboats thousands of miles of crystal trout streams kept supplied with trout by the government hatcheries radiate in every direction a natural glass cliff an indian quarry for arrowheads in the ancient days towers above a lake formed at its base by the wise and cunning beavers there is too a low mountain of low sulphur with beautiful boiling sulphur pools splashing at its foot and in contrast to these there is a gruesome volcano of mud belching from a dark malodorous cavern while almost beside this is a beautiful clear pool of hot water formed by a stream flowing from beneath a green gothic arch the wonderful canyons exhibiting such different phases of nature's sublime handiwork awe the beholder one shows the marvelous way in which lava cooling arranges itself in massive black symmetrical slabs and columns these enclose a beautiful fall that adds a touch of lightness and beauty the grand canyon is the most startling and extraordinary example of color harmony and nature sculpture to be found in the universe a japanese in the poetic imagery of his race has said that these brilliant canyon walls have caught and emblazoned upon their mural precipices the sunsets of all the yesterdays a beautiful conception one stands awed to silence in the presence of nature's immensities seen here and is almost overwhelmed by the profound splendors and majestic glories of this canyon in another respect this parkland stands in a category by itself by federal enactment all of the yellowstone park proper and some additional territory bordering it has been made a vast national game preserve something not originally planned as settlement has increased and the valleys have become occupied by farmers and ranchmen the game has been forced into the higher valleys and parks of the mountains or into their remote recesses here within the park boundaries deer elk antelope bears mountain sheep moose bison and the smaller game birds between a hundred and fifty and two hundred species and fur-bearing animals have a refuge where no hunter or trapper penetrates and danger rarely intrudes in the jackson lake country hunting is allowed for a limited period there are thousands of these various animals that know they are absolutely immune from harm by man when within the bounds of this park 
most of them have never seen a dog nor heard the sound of a rifle under these conditions their natural timidity is greatly lessened and many of them even bears become surprisingly tame from the supply which yellowstone park affords state and city parks and various game preserves are being stocked experienced men round up the yearling elk into corrals near the railway sidings and there load them into freight cars with plenty of alfalfa hay and then they are forwarded to their destination many carloads are shipped each winter the writer recently visited the park in winter to see the game animals heavy snows covering their pastures drive them down from their high ranges to the lower hills canyons and draws about gardner and mammoth hot springs and here the government during times of storm and stress feeds them alfalfa hay and thus saves them from starvation elk by hundreds or even thousands dot the hillsides there are from thirty thousand to forty thousand of them by actual count while antelope in goodly numbers range on the open and lower hill slopes in gardner canyon beside the road the beautiful mule deer and the white-tailed deer touchingly innocent and trustful and the mountain sheep the bighorn fellows stand or lie eating alfalfa and enjoying the protecting care of a beneficent animal-loving government they become almost as domesticated as barnyard animals indeed at mammoth hot springs the deer actually haunt the kitchen doors and rear themselves on their hind legs against the porch railings or even climb the steps and peer into the doors and windows mutely begging for food which they often take from one's hand at night they lie on the snow under the large trees or in some cases even sleep in the large cavalry barns which have been vacant since the soldiers were removed from the park in the fall of nineteen sixteen over at the bison range and corral on lamar river in the northeastern corner of the park one sees an interesting sight here the mountain scenery of the park reaches its finest development in summer or winter the ride to the corral from mammoth hot springs is a treat in summer the bison herd of about three hundred there is a so-called wild herd of about a hundred some miles farther south ranges in a beautiful valley and on the adjoining hills and mountain slopes near the petrified forest and death gulch it is under the care of a keeper who lives there with his family in a comfortable home provided by the government the bison are rounded up at intervals during the summer so that their condition and whereabouts shall be always known the herd originally consisted of only twenty-one animals purchased by the government in nineteen o two at a cost of fifteen thousand dollars in january nineteen seventeen i made a trip by sleigh drawn by a pair of sturdy horses to the bison corral on the hills at intervals along the entire route large bands of elk were to be seen the snow was more than two feet deep and it required two days mostly at a walk to travel the thirty-five miles between gardner and the corral the thermometer registered from ten to fifteen degrees below zero and for the week following the mercury ranged in the morning from thirty-two to fifty degrees below in winter the bison are kept in a large pasture corral a square mile in extent lying along rose creek and lamar river and here they remain very contentedly long before daylight each morning the herd congregates about the corral gate waiting for feeding time soon after daylight a sleigh is driven into the enclosure loaded with alfalfa hay and drawn by a pair of horses that have become so accustomed to the buffalo as to pay no attention to them even though the latter crowd close about them the hay is pitchforked to the ground as the sleigh is slowly driven along and the animals line themselves out following it until all are supplied in an hour or two after they have eaten their fill they mosey over to the steaming creek that has its sources in some hot springs in the hills drink slowly and long and then sedately walk back along deep trails in the snow the mother bison followed by their calves to the feeding ground where most of them then lie down and sleep for a good part of the day mock fights or hunting jousts are indulged in by some of the younger animals and afford variety and amusement to the participants at least in the dim light of a winter morning the animals resemble a herd of young elephants 
reference has been made to the fact that this particular locality is especially interesting from a geographical standpoint including the jackson lake country it is in this respect one of the most important and interesting regions on the continent it lies on both sides of the great continental divide which twists and turns in all directions in its course northward and southward outside of the limits of yellowstone park itself the mountain structure found here is perhaps not greatly different from that of other parts of the rockies the teton range lies south of the park and is one of the most prominent and commanding in the entire rocky mountain chain the park region itself seems to be a vent for the pent-up heat of the earth it is not improbable that these boiling springs and geysers may serve as escape valves and be the means of preventing very serious volcanic disturbances such as occurred here in past ages as a watershed the region is equally remarkable it has been noted that here four of the largest rivers of our country have their sources interlacing with one another it is indeed a network of thousands of mountain streams forming ultimately four great rivers each flowing to a different point of the compass the headwaters of the snake river joining with the columbia find their way into the north pacific ocean the waters of the green after a journey through the great canyons of the southwest flow into the pacific through the gulf of california to the east flows the yellowstone which merges its waters with those of the missouri and after a journey of three thousand miles flows into the atlantic through the gulf of mexico this unique region is no longer difficult of access railways reach it from three sides the north west and east and the government has spent between one million and two million dollars in establishing excellent roads to enable travelers to view the beauties of the yellowstone here is to be found the finest automobile trip of its length in the country supplemented by telephone lines and large and costly hotels the construction of these buildings must be carried on in winter and the nails used have to be heated in order to handle them with the year nineteen seventeen will disappear the last remnant of the old stage-coaching days a mode of travel which for years was the only method of land travel in the west and which until now has been the method of transportation in the park beginning with this season automobiles will displace the horses and coaches and numerous other changes in the way of increased comfort convenience and pleasure have been planned the old sixth day now becomes one of five days with several advantageous changes in route and in the time to be spent at different points the policy of our government in establishing these national parks has since been followed by other nations and it has been praised by such thoughtful observers as for example lord bryce ex-ambassador to this country from england that it has accomplished the object of its originators and is a blessing to mankind is now beyond question End of chapter four chapter five of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five firecrackers by eric pomeroy temple of the empress of heaven china this is the thirteenth day of the fifth moon of the thirty-third year of kwang zu very early in the morning that is very early for me because i ordered my boy last evening to call me at eight o'clock this morning and not a minute before here in the rambling old temple where we live we have learned to go to bed with the sun on the fourteenth and on the last day of each chinese moon because we know that the wailing pipes of the early morning celebrations before the gods on the first and fifteenth of the moon will be certain to wake us at a truly heathenish hour but when an extra unannounced unexpected festival day is ushered in with cymbals pipes and firecrackers then we just have to lose our morning sleep and try not to lose our tempers this morning is one of those dawns of misery even as i write the temple bells the drums and those peculiar jig-time horns are setting up a discordant hubbub in the courtyards while at intervals a big cracker sends me springing into the air with a start that fearfully tries my nerves 
at first this morning i endeavoured to sleep but i soon gave that up to don my kimono and sally forth to find out the cause of this gratuitous fourth of july out on the terrace in front of the inner gates of the temple to which the rays of the rising sun had not yet bent down there was gathered a small group of men and boys watching such a display of firecrackers as would have attracted a whole city hall park full of people at home yet their interest was apparently much like their numbers very small they just gazed at the exploding end of the red string of noise without any comments and without any more evident interest than they took in seeing that the small boys picked up all of the unexploded crackers that were blown out of the danger circle by their more powerful brothers my appearance in a kimono and straw sandals seemed to furnish them with more excitement than the rope of crackers which hung from the firecrackers pole hard by such a den can you imagine a string of firecrackers large and small woven together of over one hundred thousand but i am getting ahead of my story by way of introduction i meant only to tell you that i have for some time been planning to write a letter to your good editor in the hope that he might be willing to pass on to you of the fast disappearing american firecracker age my story of how this country the native land of the whip guns manufactures and uses these crackers which we think of as belonging only to our fourth of july the desire and determination to write this letter had their birth one day in a city of north china when i was walking along the street where many of the firecracker makers live since dubbed firecracker row on my private chart of the city and when i suddenly realized how much i should have liked as a boy when i was shooting off crackers to see these places and to know their ways of manufacture it is difficult not to be interrupted nor to interrupt these lines now there are two little pigtailed heads stretched out just over my window-sill peeping in and asking if i do not wish to buy the tiger lilies they have gathered on the hillside so first i will try to tell you how the crackers are made and then how they are used out here in the hope that you may find as much interest in reading the story as i have found in gathering the information and pictures for it several times i went into the city to visit firecracker row and on one occasion took a series of photographs to show more clearly than words will do the important steps in the process of manufacture the first steps consist in cutting the rough brown paper into pieces long enough to make a hollow tube of several layers in thickness and wide enough to give the tube a length just twice that of the finished firecracker from the top of his pile the workman takes a pack of these slips lays them out with one end arranged just like steps and then slides down the stairs as it were with a brush of paste so as to make the outer ends of the slips stick fast when rolled against the tube then he bends the other the dry end around an iron nail and places the nail under a board which rolls it along the slip until all the paper has curled around it once the cracker skeleton is thus formed he gives it an extra roll or two down the bench for good measure slides it off the nail into a basket and has another started before you realize what he is about then one of the small apprentices in the shop arranges the skeletons together in a six-sided bundle like those on the drawing board in cut two in each of which he puts just five hundred and seven why that particular number i could not find out once dry the skeletons receive their covering garment of red paper which makes them so truly little redskins this from the hands of one of the workers without the aid of any machine whatever he just rolls one of the narrow slips around the tube with his fingers and hurries the growing agitator into another basket to await the time for stuffing in the material that will make him such a lovely fellow once more however they all have to be packed up into the six-sided bundles this time with two stout strings tied around them a third of the way from the top and bottom leaving the middle free the worker takes his big knife and chops right down through the whole bundle to make the clean ends for the tops of the shorter tubes 
these shorter tubes next have a thin paper covering pasted over both tops and bottoms before the bottoms are closed by tapping them with a nail that is just a little larger than the hole in the tube so that it crowds down some of the paper from the sides with the bundles right side up the workman then makes holes in the paper cover over the top scatters on this the powder dust and distributes it fairly evenly among the five hundred and seven hungry ones by means of a light brush when the dust has been tamped a little the powder finds its way to the middle of the tube in the same manner the fuse is inserted by another workman the top layer of dust added and the whole supply of bottled fun packed in by another tamping with a nail and mallet completed and still crowded together in the bundles the little redskins with the fuses sticking out of their caps seem to wear a festive promising look that fairly says you give us a light and we'll do the rest and what a high old time it will be when asked how many of these bundles one man could make in a day the good-natured master of the shop said that one man is counted on to make twenty bundles up to the point where the powder is put in when the crackers are passed along to others to finish and weave into strings what a string means here in this land where the diminutive packs we used to buy for a nickel would be scored may be gathered from a glance at those which the maker is holding up in cut one and at those on the drying boards in the view shown in cut two once the crackers have been fully prepared for stringing either they are put together in such a string as you see in the pictures or they have bigger fellows four or five times the size of the little ones plated in at regular intervals then they are wrapped neatly with red or white paper in long packages bearing on the face a red slip with the shop's name printed on it in gilt characters some of these packets would have seemed monstrous needlessly extravagant in those days when i used to make one or two nickel packs last the better part of a fourth of july morning by firing them one by one in a hole in the tie post or under a tin can to give these longer strings sufficient strength to hang from a pole as is the usual way of firing them the workmen weave in with the fuses a light piece of hemp twine but even this is not an adequate protection against a break in those monster strings that come out on special occasions the one that started this letter to you was fifteen feet long when i arrived on the scene to investigate the disturbance and had already lost one half of its numbers i have seen strings from thirty to fifty feet long to keep such a string from breaking the chinese fasten it at intervals to a rope which runs through the pulley at the top of the pole and then draw the line up until the bottom clears the ground as the explosions tear away the lowest firecrackers the rope is let down and at the same time held out away from the bottom of the pole to make a graceful curve of the last few feet of the string when such long strings have eaten themselves up you can imagine the amount of fragments around the base of the pole there are literally baskets full of them to be first wetted down to guard against fire and then swept up or allowed to blow away when the winds so will thus far you have heard only of little and big crackers however there are many distinguishing names among the chinese for the several varieties and sizes which i am going to give you before passing on to the story of the special uses of firecrackers in the chinese life first come the ordinary pian pao or whip guns the small ones which derive their name from the similarity which their explosion bears to the snapping of a whip sometimes they are called simply whips in the same way that the chinese speak of many things by shortened or changed names to make these names seem more real to you i have had my chinese teacher write out for me on separate slips the characters which represent them more diminutive than the ordinary crackers are the small whips about an inch long that are made especially for the small children to use without danger for one american cent you could buy about one hundred of these then above the whip guns the next class is the bursting bamboos which are said to have taken their name from the fact that in early times bamboo was used as the tubes for these crackers if such were the case a line of them must have made the splinters fly 
even still more powerful are the hemp thunderers or to take a little liberty with the translation the hemp sons of thunder whose name also indicates their construction and their magnitude bearing a close similarity in power to our cannon crackers these have been known at times to break the second-story paper windows in a small compound they play an important part in the worshipping or propitiating of the gods in our courtyard inasmuch as it is considered good form to set them off at intervals while the whip guns which my teacher assures me do not require any watching are keeping up their unbroken stream of praise and prayer they may be considered as good lusty amens throughout the service slightly different in form are the double noises which are nothing more or less than our boosters that go off first on the ground and then again up in the air to intersperse these throughout the explosions of the whips during any special demonstration is also considered good form then allied to these we find another booster which when it explodes on the ground drives ten others up into the air to become the flying in heaven ten sounds with the chinese these are only for play and that chiefly in the homes from the thirteenth to the seventeenth days of the first moon of the year with the lamp flower exploders that is our flower pot the list of the most common forms of firecrackers and fireworks becomes exhausted although the chinese have several other less usual species together with many alternative names for both these and the ones i have mentioned the time when the chinese receive these crackers is at the new year season when among the well-to-do families of tientsin and peking it is customary to give a boy the equivalent of our fifty cents for his purchases in peking the shops issue special red notes like our old shin plasters in value for this one use at the new year in giving the cracker money to the boys the parents often make smaller presents to the girls who are wont to buy paper flowers with their pennies in proof of which the chinese have a proverb which runs girls like flowers boys like crackers but this juvenile use of the whip guns consumes only an infinitesimal part of the whole supply of the year at many festivals and on many occasions the head of the house the manager of the shop or the officers of the guild require great quantities of these propitious harbingers greatest of all occasions is the passing of the year when the people keep up the successor to the ancient custom of setting off the bamboo guns in order to drive away the evil spirits of the past twelve month and to usher in all that is good for the coming one all night long the crackers have been popping in the town below and an early gathering in the temple is held to add the final touch before the new day shall break when morning came i wandered leisurely to my office through the business section of the town to watch the fun at the big shops never shall i forget the picture of that street with its dozen or more great red strings of crackers hanging in front of the bigger hongs and seemingly waiting for some word to start the fusillade fortunately this came and the storm broke as i waited for sheer noise vivacity and demonstrative liveliness i never have seen the equal of these snarling bursting lines that poured out their wrath with incessant fervour upon the evil spirits below and shot up their welcome to the good ones above then although this display on new year's day seemed grand enough to last a long time there came more explosions as the shops took down their doors and began their routine business on the fifth or sixth of the moon furthermore custom demands in certain parts that throughout the first ten days of the year there shall be occasional snappings of the whips to be followed on the fifteenth at the feast of lanterns by a still greater demonstration when a new shop is opened it is customary for all the front boards to be left up until just before the opening ceremony takes place then one or two boards are taken down the manager and his assistants come out to light a string of crackers and as the whips are snapping the remaining boards come down to the sound of this propitious music of the land 
very often there are several strings hung from poles or tripods and one is lighted after the other in such a way as to maintain a long unbroken stream of noise in most parts of the empire it is also customary for an official when he receives the seals of office from his predecessor to have a string of crackers let off at the proper moment and i must confess to having yielded myself to the pressure of my chinese assistants in having purchased a few for use at the time we opened our new office at this place likewise when a military official is leaving a post he is usually accorded a send-off with crackers which have been subscribed for by his men and thus from what has gone before you may catch some idea of the persistency with which the little redskins have poked their noses into almost all the important celebrations of the chinese life End of chapter five chapter six of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six curious clocks by charles a brassler many of the german cities of the middle ages enjoyed great prosperity which they liked to exhibit in the form of splendid churches and other public buildings and each one tried to excel the others when therefore in the year thirteen fifty two strasburg was the first to erect a great cathedral clock which not only showed the hour to hundreds of observers but whose strokes proclaimed it far and near there was a rivalry among the rich cities as to which should set up within its walls the most beautiful specimen of this kind the citizens of nuremberg who were renowned all over the european world for their skill were particularly jealous of strasburg's precedence over them in 1356, when the Imperial Council, or Reichstag, held in Nuremberg, issued the Golden Bull, an edict, or so-called Imperial Constitution, which promised to be of greatest importance to the welfare of the kingdom, a locksmith, whose name is unfortunately not recorded, took this as his idea for the decoration of a clock which was set up in the Frauenkirche in the year 1361 the emperor charles the fourth was represented seated upon a throne at the stroke of twelve the seven electors large moving figures passed and bowed before him to the sound of trumpets this work of art made a great sensation other european cities naturally desired to have similar sights and large public clocks were therefore erected in breslau in 1368 in Rouen in 1389, in Metz in 1391, in Speyer in 1395, in Augsburg in 1398, in Lübeck in 1405, in Magdeburg in 1425, in Padua in 1430, in Danzig in 1470, in Prague in 1490, in Venice in 1495, and in Lyon in 1598 not all of course were as artistic as that of nuremberg but no town now contented itself with a simple clockwork to tell the hours some had a stroke for the hours and some had chimes the one showed single characteristic moving figures while others were provided with great astronomical works showing the day of the week month and year the phases of the moon the course of the planets and the signs of the zodiac on the town clock of Compiègne, which was built in 1405, three figures of soldiers, or Jacquemar, so called, in England they are called Jacks, struck the hour upon three bells under their feet, and they are doing it still. The great clock of Dijon has a man and a woman sitting upon an iron framework which supports the bell upon which they strike the hours. In 1714, the figure of a child was added to strike the quarters. The most popular of the mechanical figures was the cock, flapping his wings and crowing. The clock on the Aschersleben Rathaus shows, besides the phases of the moon, two pugnacious goats which butt each other at each stroke of the hour. Also the wretched Tantalus, who at each stroke opens his mouth and tries to seize a golden apple which floats down, but in the same moment it is carried away again. 
on the rathaus clock in jena is also a representation of tantalus opening his mouth as in eichersleben but here the apple is not present and the convulsive efforts of the figure to open the jaws wide become ludicrous one of the first clocks with which important astronomical works were connected is that of the marienkirche in lübeck now restored below at the height of a man's head is the plate which shows the date of the week month etc these calculations are so reliable that the extra day of leap year is pushed in automatically every four years the plate is more than three meters in diameter above it is the dial almost as large the numbers from one to twelve are repeated so that the hour hand goes around the dial only once in twenty-four hours in the wide space between the axis which carries the hand and the band where the hours are marked the fixed stars and the course of the planets are represented the heavens are here shown as they appear to an observer in lübeck in the old works the movement of the planets was given incorrectly for they all were shown as completing a revolution around the sun in three hundred and sixty days of course this is absurd mercury for example revolves once around the sun in eighty-eight days while saturn requires twenty-nine years and a hundred and sixty-six days for one revolution when this astronomical clock was repaired some years ago a very complicated system of wheels had to be devised to reproduce accurately the great difference in the movement of the planets the work consumed two years there are a great number of moving figures on the lubeck clock but they are not of the most conspicuous interest in spite of this however they excite more wonder among the crowds of tourists who are always present when the clock strikes twelve than the really remarkable and admirable astronomical and calendar works the strasbourg clock has more than all the others an actually world-wide fame and no traveller who visits the beautiful old city fails to see the curious and interesting spectacle which it offers daily at noontime to quote from one such visitor long before the clock strikes twelve a crowd has assembled in the high arched portico of the stately cathedral to be sure of not missing the right moment men and women of both high and low degree strangers and townspeople alike await in suspense the arrival of the twelfth hour the moment approaches and there is breathless silence an angel lifts a sceptre and strikes four times upon a bell another turns over an hourglass which he holds in the hand a story higher an old man is seen to issue from a space decorated in gothic style he strikes four times with his crutch upon a bell and disappears at the other side while the figure of death lets the bone in its hand fall slowly and solemnly twelve times upon the hour bell in still another story of the clock the saviour sits enthroned bearing in the left hand a banner of victory the right hand raised in benediction as soon as the last stroke of the hour has died away the apostles appear from an opening at the right hand of the master one by one they turn and bow before him departing at the other side christ lifts his hand in blessing to each apostle in turn and when the last has disappeared he blesses the assembled multitude a cock on a side tower flaps his wings and crows three times a murmur passes through the crowd and it disperses filled with wonder and admiration at the spectacle it has witnessed in fifteen seventy four the strasbourg astronomical clock replaced the older one it was mainly the work of dasypodius a famous mathematician and it ran until seventeen eighty nine later the celebrated clockmaker johann baptiste chevy born december eighteenth seventeen seventy two determined to repair it after endless negotiations with the church authorities he obtained the contract and october second eighteen forty two the clock as made over was solemnly reconsecrated in very recent days the clock of the city hall in olmutz also renovated has become a rival to that of the strasbourg cathedral in the year fifteen sixty it was described by a traveller as a true marvel together with the strasbourg clock and that of the marienkirche in danzig but as the years passed it was almost inconceivably neglected and everything movable and portable about it was carried off 
now after repairs which have been almost the same as constructing it anew it works almost faultlessly in the lower part of the clock is the calendar with the day of the year month and week and the phases of the moon together with the astronomical plate a story higher a large number of figures move around a group of angels and here is also a good portrait of the empress maria theresa still higher is an arrangement of symbolical figures and decorations which worthily crowns the whole a youth and a man above at the left announce the hours and quarters by blows of a hammer the other figures go through their motions at noonday scarcely have the blows of the man's hammer ceased to sound when a shepherd boy in another wing of the clock begins to play a tune he has six different pieces which can be alternated as soon as he has finished the chimes sixteen bells begin and the figures of st george of rudolph of Habsburg, with the priest and of adam and eve appear in the left centre when they have disappeared the chimes ring their second melody and the figures of the right centre appear the three kings of the east before the enthroned virgin and the holy family on the flight into egypt when the bells ring for the third time all the figures show themselves once more clocks operated by electricity are of course the product of recent times england's largest electric clock was as our illustration shows recently christened in a novel manner the makers messrs gent and company of leicester entertained about seventy persons at luncheon on this occasion using one of the four mammoth dials as a dining table a timetable as the guest facetiously styled it the clock was installed two hundred and twenty feet above the ground in the tower of the royal liverpool society's new building in liverpool each of the four dials which weigh fifteen tons together measure twenty-five feet in diameter with a minute hand fourteen feet long the hands are actuated electrically by a master clock connected with the greenwich observatory after dark they are illuminated by electricity and are visible at a great distance still larger are the dials of the great electric clock situated three hundred and forty six feet high in the tower of the metropolitan life building on madison square new york city they measure twenty six and one half feet in diameter the minute hand is seventeen feet from end to end and twelve feet from centre to point while the hour hand measures thirteen feet four inches in all and eight feet four inches from the centre of the dial outward these immense hands are of iron framework sheathed in copper and weigh a thousand and seven hundred pounds respectively the big clock and the ninety-nine other clocks in the building are regulated from a master clock in the director's room on the second floor which sends out minute impulses and is adjusted to run within five seconds per month at night the dial hands and numerals are beautifully illuminated of which we present a picture the enlarged minute hand showing the length of exposure the time is also flashed all night in a novel manner from the great gilded lantern at the apex of the tower six hundred and ninety-six feet above the pavement the quarter hours are announced from each of the four faces of the lantern by a single red light the halves by two red flashes the three quarters by three flashes on the hour the white arc lights are extinguished temporarily and white flashes show the number of the hour this takes the place of the bells operated in the daytime they are in four tones g fifteen hundred pounds f two thousand pounds e flat three thousand pounds and b flat seven thousand pounds and each quarter hour ring out the westminster chimes in successive bars these are the highest chimes in the world being situated on the forty-second floor six hundred and fifteen feet above the street level and they attract much attention from visitors End of chapter six